like the democracy order, order and Professor order. Costa think that the changes made by the opposition PM, are very regressive. The debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 97. The debate may be resumed at a later hour. The member for Melbourne Ports will have leave to continue speaking when the debate is resumed. Order will members please quickly take their places. Order the Chief Chief Government Whip. Order I have received a return to the writ which I issued on the fourth of August two thousand eight for the election of a member to serve for the electoral division of Mayo in the state of South Australia to fill the vacancy caused by the resignation of the Honourable Alexander Downer. By the endorsement on the writ, it is certified that Jamie Edward Briggs has been elected. Admit him. swear that you will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, according to law. So help you God. Order the Leader of the House on Indulgence. Thank, thanks, Mr. Speaker. Um, just to, uh, for the benefit of members and as a courtesy, it is uh, likely and indeed hopeful that the House will rise today at uh, 6 pm or before. Um, if need be, in order to uh, facilitate that, we will negate the adjournment. Um, so, in terms of uh, people being able to make their arrangements, I uh, felt it was best to inform the House at the earliest possible opportunity. Order. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Acting Prime Minister. I refer the Acting Prime Minister to the Prime Minister's comments in New York, where he appealed for bipartisanship between the Republican and Democratic parties in dealing with the international financial crisis. Why is the Prime Minister preaching political peace to the US Congress but playing cheap politics here at home, where he refuses my offer of bipartisanship to meet the great economic challenges facing all Australians? The Acting Prime Minister. Order. Acting Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I very much welcome this question from the Leader of the Opposition. And can I say to him, we would welcome bipartisanship. We would welcome bipartisanship on delivering the government's budget in these uncertain global times. And it seems to me remarkable that the Leader of the Opposition would call for bipartisanship on a day on which his Liberal Party has shown less economic responsibility than every, every independent member of the Senate and even the Greens. His Liberal Party has stood in the way 
of the condensate measure in the Senate. They voted against it. It's been delivered on the votes of the government, the independents Order. and the Greens. He was there ready to punch a $2.1 billion hole in the government's surplus this morning. This morning in the Senate, as, this, uh, as we prepared for question time, there was the Liberal Party punching a $2.1 billion hole in the government's budget. Less economic responsibility than Senator Fielding, less economic responsibility than Senator Xenophon, less economic responsibility than the Greens. Order has the Acting Prime Minister finished. The Leader of the House uh, the Leader of the Opposition of oh, the relevance, Mr. Speaker, unless the, oh, unless, no, the unless the Acting Prime the Minister the says six billion dollars of new tax. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his, his seat. The Acting Prime Minister is responding so, to the question. Uh, I was asked about bipartisanship, and let me tell you where it can start. It can start on delivering the Medicare levy surcharge changes the government has reintroduced into the House today in order, in order to give hard-working Australians some tax relief. He could indicate some bipartisanship order. by saying that he regrets showing the economic vandalism and irresponsibility that the Liberal Party showed in order. the Senate Member this morning. He could show some bipartisanship on the delivery of the government's budget. The Leader of the Opposition is a man who claims to know something about economics. Well, you don't need to be an expert to come to this very simple conclusion. In uncertain global economic times, the last thing that we can afford Order. is budget uncertainty Order. here at home. In uncertain economic times globally, we need to deliver budget certainty. If he's offering bipartisanship, that's where it should start. Deliver the budget, deliver it in whole, and deliver the Medicare levy surcharge. The member for Deakin. Order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline for the House the conclusions of the Reserve Bank's Financial Stability Review released today? The Treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I certainly welcome the question. Uh, today we've had the Reserve Bank's half yearly financial stability review uh, delivered, and it certainly does highlight the difficult global environment that we face. The report, I think, adds weight, adds weight to the government's view that we're not immune from global difficulties, but we are certainly well placed to withstand the fallout. If I could just quote from the report this morning. Just quote from the report. While the Australian financial system has not been completely insulated from developments abroad, it is weathering the current difficulties much better than many other financial systems. It also goes on to highlight the strengths of our financial system, Mr Speaker, which is very important at a time such as this. And I quote, the Australian financial system has coped better with the recent turmoil than many other financial systems. The banking system is soundly capitalised and it continues to record strong profitability and has low levels of problem loans. So the Reserve Bank stresses this, Mr Speaker, that we do not face the same problems as those that are at the core of the US financial market troubles. If I could quote again. It's important to note, however, that the ratio of banks' problem loans to total assets remains below the average since the mid-1990s, a period of unusually low credit losses. So, Mr Speaker, this report underscores the strength of the IMF report yesterday. Two reports, Mr Speaker, which are very welcome. But certainly, Mr Speaker, the government is not resting on its laurels. There are some things we can control and there are some things we can't control, Mr Speaker. And one of the things that we can control is that we have built a strong surplus, Mr Speaker. A strong surplus, a strong surplus to act as a buffer against global uncertainty, Mr Speaker. Now I heard earlier, I heard earlier the Leader of the Opposition pretend that he was in favour of bipartisanship. The fact that he could do that within 30 minutes of a vote in the Senate, where the Liberal and National parties opposed the condensate measure, is, is breathtaking. He'd make a cat laugh, Mr Speaker. His, his hide is so thick. How can he, on the one hand, call for bipartisanship and, on the other, blow the surplus apart in the Senate, Mr Speaker. It's like somebody calling for peace 
and then turning around and throwing a grenade, Mr. Speaker. That's what it's like. I mean, it's entirely phony. It's entirely phony. We certainly welcome bipartisanship. We would welcome it at a time of global economic uncertainty. We certainly do. Thank those uh, minor parties in the Senate who, and independents who voted for the condensate measure. We thank the Greens, we thank Senator Xenophon, and we thank Senator Fielding, because, as the, de as the uh, acting Prime Minister said before, they have got more economic responsibility in their little finger than those opposite have got in their whole body, Mr. Speaker. And the height of them to come into this House and claim to be in, fa in favour of bipartisanship and the height of the new leader of the opposition to claim that he represents some new era of economic leadership. Everybody knows that at a time of, glo a time of global economic uncertainty, we need a strong surplus. This government has put a strong surplus together to act as a buffer and to fund investment for the future, Mr Speaker. And, 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 that, process, and that process has been given a huge Order. tick, a huge tick, Order. a huge tick by the IMF. And if they ever needed a reason to support the government's budget measures in the Senate, it's contained in the Reserve Bank report today. Member for North Sydney. The Leader of the Opposition. Yeah, Mr Speaker, on indulgence and very briefly, I just want to note I think it's important in these times to note the, 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 the opposition endorses the comments of the Treasurer about the financial stability review. Order but the, plainly, we order, don't agree with what he said the, about the surplus. The, but the Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of the Opposition will resume his seat. The Leader of Order. Order. Indulgence is something that is not given lightly, and we should remember that in the future. The member for McPherson. So, oh. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting prime minister. Does the Acting Prime Minister stand by her statement that it is impossible to live on the pension of $273 a week? With a $22 billion Order. surplus, Order. why won't the Order. government— Order. 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 Members on both sides of the chamber are not assisting. Order. Order. The member for McPherson. With a $22 billion surplus, why won't the government do something for pensioners right Order. now? The acting Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Shadow Minister for ageing for her question. And can I make the following simple points in return? Firstly, the member might like to investigate and find out that the pension has actually been the subject of indexation. Uh, in, in, indexation the measures, indexation the measures were delivered this week, and a, a proportion of the utilities allowance, $128, was delivered this week. So she may want to get her facts right when she asks the question. Point number two: the shadow minister for ageing uses the surplus figure. Well, maybe the Shadow Minister for Ageing might like to reflect on the fact that she is a member of a political party that is determined to destroy that surplus and is Order. acting in the Senate Order. each and the every day to destroy that surplus. The member for McPherson on a point of order. Yes, on relevance. Mr. Speaker, order. I the member specifically for McPherson will resume her seat. On the, on the point of order, the point of order you've been raised with me on relevance. The acting prime minister is responding to the question. The acting prime minister. Second point, it was the member herself who, in her question, raised the budget surplus, and I've simply explained to her a basic economic fact 
which seems not capable of understanding by members of the Liberal Party. In the, in the walk from the government benches over to the opposition benches, they've lost every strip of economic credibility, and they no longer seem to understand Order. simple facts like they are on a course to punch a major hole in the surplus. And had they won the vote in the Senate earlier today, $2.1 billion would have been ripped out of the surplus figure she quotes in her question. And then, of course, directly on the question of the age pension, can I say to the Shadow Minister for Ageing uh, uh, as for follows. When, when the Shadow Minister for Ageing was a member of the Howard government, the minister responsible for families and community services, the then member for Longman, went to the Howard government cabinet with a proposal for an increase in the base rate of the pension, and the Howard government rejected it. Earlier this year, when the shadow the minister for, for ageing said for she and the Liberal Party were committed to an increase in the base rate of the pension, she was slapped down, slapped down and repudiated by the now member leader of the Cook. opposition, then the shadow treasurer. Indeed, the leader of the opposition did not advocate an increase in the base rate of the pension until he came last week to sit in the chair member of the leader Cook. of the opposition. Now, compared with that track record, this is a government. This is a government that is delivering practical measures and did it in the recent budget. We delivered for older Australians a $500 cash bonus. We delivered for older Australians a $500 utilities bonus, and $128 of that utilities bonus has been delivered in the last week. And this is a government. Unlike the Howard government, which as recently as last year turned its back on Australian pensioners, this is a government that has said, we understand that it's tough on the age pension. We understand that action is needed on the age pension. We also understand that it's important to get that action right. Not a proposition that leaves two million pensioners out, as the proposition put by the Liberal Party did. Not a proposition that's unconstitutional, as the Liberal Party's proposition was. Not a, a proposition that didn't understand the intersections between the age pension and other parts of the social security system. This is a government that's already delivered practical measures to make a difference. This is a government that is proceeding in a responsible manner both responsible in policy and responsible economically, the Liberal Party is committed to neither, neither policy responsibility nor economic responsibility. The member for Bonner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Health and Ageing. Why are changes to the Medicare levy surcharge thresholds necessary, and is there opposition to these changes? The Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. Yesterday, the leader of the opposition denied 330,000 Australians tax cuts worth up to $1,500 for many families. Order. Shame, shame. Order. The leader of the opposition. The leader of the opposition. The leader of the opposition, the acting prime minister. How much is that going to cost? Order. Order. They can cut taxes. The Leader of the Opposition has not got the call. The Minister for Health has. Minister. Today we announced a new bill into the House with a clear message for the Leader of the Opposition. He needs to be able to look those 330,000 Australians in the eye and explain why he refuses to support a tax cut for them. He needs to be able to do that. Now, I've been, giving, I've been giving a lot of thought to why it is that the Liberal Party is so Member doggedly hanging on to the threshold of $50,000. And after a lot of thought, I've decided that there Member are only Goldstein. three possible options. The first option is that the $50,000 threshold set by the Liberal Party, that there was so much scientific justification for choosing that $50,000 threshold that they cannot dare change them ever. 
The second option would be that the original thresholds were set in such a way that, although they weren't relevant at the time they were introduced, that they would somehow be magically relevant today when they are being defended by the Liberals so doggedly. The third, the third would be that the Liberal Party think that $50,000 is a high income and they don't think that people earning $50,000 deserve tax relief, something that the Leader of the Opposition is trying to contest. So on option one, is there any scientific justification for this threshold that they are so doggedly Hanging to. Members might not remember that I uh, advised the House of some comments made by Mr Michael Wooldridge, then the Health Minister, about how these thresholds were set. And just in case any members have forgotten, I might remind them. His quote was, I think the numbers in the end were negotiated with Senator Haradine over a bottle of Jamison's whisky late at night. So much for there being any scientific justification. The second one, that they were not relevant at the time they were introduced, but they were going to be magically relevant today. But Dr Wooldridge gave us some assistance on this issue as well. And I quote again, we were happy to successfully get through 12 months, let alone worry about a problem in 10 years to come. And of course, we know that the member for Dixon, having answered questions in the House on this matter, sat idly by as part of the government as the numbers of people hit by this tax slug doubled and then tripled, and he did nothing. He did nothing. The for option, is three, gone. option three, that the Liberals think that $50,000 is a high income. Well, interestingly, Liberal Senator Birmingham was asked exactly this question this morning. An AAP reported that Senator Simon Birmingham conceded that $50,000 was not a high salary. In fact, and I quote, he said, it's certainly not a high salary, indeed it's a working salary. A working salary where the members opposite are denying people on a working Member salary this sort of tax relief. Let me quote what Dale, a caller to 3AW this morning, said. I'm one of those poor people working hard who has to take a second job to help for bills and I can't Member afford for North PHI Sydney. in the first the for place. North Sydney. There is just not the money and the there for to be pushing $51,000 a year. And he said, I can't afford it. The money is simply not there. Order. All over Australia, Order. people have a sinking Member feeling, like Dale, that the Liberal Party are not going to help working families. Order. But Order. the only sinking Member feeling Dixon. that the Leader of the Opposition the feels is if he loads his gondola up with too much Italian luggage. I mean, really, this is ridiculous. So the thresholds, the thresholds. Order. Order. The House will come to order. The Member for Canning. Party doggedly are hanging on to are not logical. They are not designed with any thought of the consequences in 10 years' time, and now they are hitting families that even Liberal senators call those on working salaries. So, Mr. Speaker, there is a sh there is an easy question for the leader of the opposition to answer today. Does he think people on $50,000 deserve a tax cut or not? Now, the leader of the opposition, he can turn his back. But does he think people on $50,000 deserve a tax Order. cut or not? He can vote on that here. He can provide tax cut and relief to 50, 000, people earning $50,000 every now. And if he's not going to deliver that tax cut, Remember he should jump on his gondola and head back to Venice. The member for Dixon. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is also to the Minister for Health. I refer the minister to the Senate inquiry into the changes to the Medicare levy surcharge, the submission of private health insurer NIB states, and I quote, the changes have seriously affected investor confidence in the private health care sector, and the consequence can only be less investment Order, in private finance. sector services and infrastructure such as hospital beds. Of course, this will only place further pressure on the public health system, end quote. Will the minister guarantee that private health insurance premiums will not rise and that public hospital waiting lists will not grow as a result of the government's changes to the Medicare levy. Order. 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 The Minister, the Minister for Health and Ageing. Thank you, Mr Speaker. One clear thing that I can guarantee this House is that we will back public hospitals more than you ever did. More than you ever, ever did. Oh, the member for Dixon so has asked his question. The member for Dixon also wants guarantees about premiums. Now, let's 
be honest about this. The yes. member for Dixon. Order. Order. The member for Dixon, who's been in the job only for three days, still knows. He already Order. knows that it would be totally irresponsible for us to try to make some projections about premiums oh. when private Order. health insurance the funds. Minister for Health will resume his seat. Minister for Health will resume his seat. The Minister for Health will resume his seat. The member for Dixon on a point of order. Well, it goes to relevance, though, Mr. Speaker. The minister has introduced a bill. There must have been order. modelling as to how much this member bill will increase will private health insurance. Seat. The member for Dixon will resume his seat. The minister is, being, is responding to the question, and I will listen carefully to her response. The minister for health and ageing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The truth is that the member opposite does not want to have an answer from us on premiums, where private health insurers are the ones who make applications at the end of the year for the premiums that they are seeking. It is not the job of government to predict Order. what that will be. Order. Now, it doesn't matter Order. how loud the member for Dixon the member yells. For Moncrief. The truth is that there are, of course, very commer commercially sensitive uh, information. Not that we are. Not that we. Uh, withholding, but that the private insurers the themselves do not the provide to government Sturt. until the application round increases. But I also might say something else, and I notice how readily the member opposite wants to quote the private health insurers. Yes. I do think that the private health insurers' views on premiums will be about as objective the as the member for Bradfield's view would be on the member for Wentworth. Now, this is a ridiculous Order. position. Order. The Minister for Health will resume a seat. The manager of opposition business. Mr. Speaker, this was a very serious question about the impact of government policy on public hospitals and private insurance premiums. If the minister can't give a guarantee, oh, the, the she member, should pull the bill oh, and apologise. Oh, the member for North Sydney resume seat. The mem well, it was not a point of order. The member for oh, the minister has finished. The member for Ford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Will the Minister advise the House on reactions to the Government's nation-building agenda, and is the Minister aware of any threats to the Government's efforts to rebuild the nation's infrastructure? The Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Ford for his question. Indeed, the government's nation-building agenda has received widespread support, and that's not surprising, because we went to the election with a plan to have an infrastructure minister and an infrastructure department, and we've done it. We had a mandate to introduce uh, legislation to establish Infrastructure Australia, and we've done it. We had a mandate to establish the Building Australia Fund, and we've done it. We did this over a number of years in the lead-up to the November 2007 election, and in that, in, that, uh, in that period we were surprised, frankly, that the opposition continued to ignore infrastructure as they had for 12 long years. But uh, though it's therefore not surprising that uh, the government's agenda, uh, particularly particularly the agenda of establishing nation-building funds in terms of infrastructure, in terms of education infrastructure and health infrastructure, has received such widespread support. Indeed, we stated that our priorities would be rail, road, ports and broadband. And once again, that has received widespread support from the Australian business community. And of course, just yesterday, the International Monetary Fund released a report endorsing the government's strong approach on these issues. And that's why I was surprised, frankly, Mr Speaker, that those opposite have learnt absolutely nothing during this process. Because in today's Australia, on top of their attempt to, uh, to trash our budget surplus, in today's Australia, the new shadow minister for infrastructure, of course they didn't bother having an infrastructure minister in government, but the new Shadow Minister for Infrastructure has threatened to oppose the Building Australia Fund. Has threatened to oppose the Building Australia Fund. Threatened to oppose nation building. Quite an extraordinary position. And they've come up with a whole range of reasons, perhaps, of why that should be the case. 
They uh, have argued that there are some weaknesses in the Infrastructure Australia legislation. Well, I remind them that they moved amendments in the Senate, which we, we rejected when it came back to the House, and then they folded their deck of cards and voted for Infrastructure Australia. They did that because of pressure from the business community, pressure from the business community who want a nation-building agenda, but also pressure from people in their electorates who want issues such as urban congestion addressed and, and, and addressed with the support and national coordination from the federal government. There's criticism about some of the uh, arrangements that are, are made regarding the way that the fund will be managed. Well, that's pretty extraordinary too because, of course, we have stated that the Future Fund Board of Guardians, which they set up, which they set up will manage the funds. We're currently finalising the arrangements to allow the fund to be set up by 1 January 2009. Order. The Leader of the House for his seat. The member for Goldstein on a point of order. Mr Speaker, the minister was asked about threats to the proper application of these funds. On relevance, Mr Speaker, the minister has not addressed the order. prospect the of this being an Goldstein. almighty Labor slush the fund. The member for Goldstein knows that the latter part of that was not a point of order and he is warned. The Leader, the Minister for Infrastructure, will respond to the question. Thanks, Mr Speaker. As, uh, as uh, I'll quote from the Merchant of Venice, I am not bound to please you with my answer. Order. The Mr. member for Mr. Minister Speaker. will resume addressing the question. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I certainly will, Mr Speaker. But they need to understand. Order. Those opposite need to understand Order. in threatening in threatening the Building Australia Fund, they are threatening support for broadband access for Australians. They are threatening solutions to urban congestion. They are saying that they want parents to remain stuck in traffic jams rather than spending time at home with their kids. The fact is the fact is that their opportunism knows no bounds. In, uh, in threatening to oppose these funds in such an extraordinary fashion, they are showing just how out of touch they are, Mr Speaker, just how out of touch they are with their constituents in their electorates, but also with the building community, with the Business Council of Australia, with the Australian Industry Group, with every other business organisation in this country that is supporting the Building Australia Fund and supporting the other long-term investment funds. They should, they should wake up to themselves, get in touch with their electorates, get in touch with their business community and support Labor's nation-building agenda. The member for North Sydney. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, my question is to the Acting Prime Minister. I refer the Acting Prime Minister to the statement by the member for Longman in this House that legitimate retribution could be taken against members of parliament that vote against the government and that, and I quote, if revenue measures are blocked, infrastructure projects in the opposition as electorates ought to be blocked. Does the acting prime minister agree with a member for Longman that this, and I quote, would be a great way to handle the distribution of taxpayers' money? The acting prime minister. That's our, the National Party. Order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the uh, Manager of Opposition Business for his question. Uh, this is a government that believes, when it comes to dispersing government funds, there should be proper processes. Yeah, yeah. That, Order. that Order. was not a belief Order. shared by the Howard government. Order. That was not a belief shared by the Howard government when it Order. had its regional partnerships program. And do I need to remind members of the Liberal Party about the Order. things that were uncovered about the regional partnerships program and its straight out unmitigated political manipulation by the Howard government for advantage of the members Order. in marginal the seats and national Prime Minister party resume seats. Her seat. Order. The member for Sturt on a point of order. On a point of order, Mr Speaker, on relevance, the question was, did you support the member for order. Longman's the member comments for or not? Well, That's what we seat. Want to know the member for Sturt will resume his seat. The member for Sturt will resume his seat. The acting Prime Minister is addressing the question. 
The Acting Prime Minister. I can understand why members of the opposition and Liberal Party don't like to be reminded of their shameful track record when it comes to regional rorts. A shameful track record of waste and manipulation for political purposes. Order. The Acting Prime Minister resume her seat. Member for Ryan on a point of order. Mr Speaker, relevance. It was about the member for Longman's views. The member will resume his seat. Well, to be consistent with earlier events of a few months ago, if, if that's the stress that's placed on the question, it's a, it's a borderline question. Now, as, as, a, as I take it, the Acting Prime Minister is responding on behalf of the government. The Acting Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The approach the of this— The Acting Prime Minister will resume a seat. I would, have, I would have thought that members that had actually had executive office in government would know the distinguish, distinguishment between members of the government and members of the governing party. The Acting Prime Minister. The member for thanks. <laughs> The Acting call. Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I remind members opposite that the approach of this government is one where we have established Infrastructure Australia to advise on infrastructure decisions, the first time that we have had a body to comprehensively look at the need for a nation-building agenda. We know, looking across this country, there are communities crying out for nation-building projects. We've got urban congestion. We've got bottlenecks when it comes to rail, when it comes to ports, when it comes to the transfer of goods from rail the to ports. These are economic capacity constraints. They are things that confront working Australians every day as they try and do something as simple as travel to work. Infrastructure Australia is there to provide objective advice. When it comes to the other funds that the government is establishing, for example the Education Investment Fund in my own portfolio, there will be an objective advisory structure. All of this stands in stark contrast to the days well, when the uh, former member for Dawson yeah. would manipulate documents immediately before caretaker periods in order to splash money out in marginal seats Order. to assist Howard government members. A shameful track record, <coughs> one that Liberal Party members should recall, and one of these days they should apologise to the Australian people for it. The member for Robertson. Yes. My Order. question. Order. My question is to the Minister or, for Finance order, and Deregulation. Order. The member for Robinson is going to have to start again because I could not hear her above the babble. The member for Robinson. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Deregulation. How do efforts to block the budget restrict the government's ability to respond to uncertain international economic circumstances? The uh, Minister for Finance and Deregulation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Robertson for her question. Order. The member for Sturt. Minister Mr. Speaker, order. the government is committed to delivering long-term sustainable growth for Australia, and in order to do that, the government has set out a very clear plan to pursue that objective that is focused on the development of long-term investment in infrastructure through the three big infrastructure funds and establishing major projects such as the National Broadband Network, the Education Revolution, long overdue action on climate change and water, improving productivity in our workplaces, our businesses through deregulation, through regulatory reform, and of course, the most important element of all, Mr Speaker, a strong budget surplus. Now, the opposition's response to the government's plan, Mr Speaker, has been completely incoherent totally incoherent. The opposition tells us that they support lower taxes, and apart from lower taxes for Ferrari buyers and Porsche buyers, the track record suggests the opposite, Mr Speaker, because they have just Order. defeated in the Senate the member for they have just defeated in the Senate a reform measure with respect to the Medicare levy surcharge that would have delivered substantial tax relief to thousands upon thousands of middle income families in Australia. They say they want to spend up big on pensioners, and yet they have defeated the government's initiatives with respect to dental services for low-income earners and pensioners in the Senate. 
So they didn't seem to really care very much about pensioners there. And while they're suggesting the government should spend up big helping pensioners, at the same time they're endeavouring to make it much harder for the government to do that by blowing giant holes in the surplus. And of course, they claim to be the party of responsible economic management. But they are deliberately spreading fear, they are deliberately seeking to talk up the risks to the Australian economy through things like suggesting that Medibank private and private health insurers are in financial difficulties, thereby undermining confidence amongst investors, undermining confidence amongst consumers, with significant potential negative impacts for the economy into the medium term, Mr Speaker. Now, Mr Speaker, a couple of days ago I confessed that I was feeling a bit nostalgic about the absence of the former Leader of the Opposition, the member for Bradfield. Well, I'm sad to say, Mr Speaker, I'm sad to say it's getting worse. It's getting worse. There's got to be some treatment I can get for this condition, Mr Speaker. It's getting worse. Minister of Finance will assume his seat, the Manager of Opposition Business, on a point of order. We've got billboards around Sydney with a treatment for that order. sort of condition. Order. The, me <laughs> the, member, the member for North Sydney has sought Speaker a call for a the minister is responding to the question. Uh, I bet you know the number of the order. Order. <laughs> Mr. Minister. Speaker, the member for That's Braden. Right. The member for Braden. I've got no idea the minister what's on has the call. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, now, the the former leader of the opposition, of course on major economic issues had a habit of sitting on the fence. At least he knew where the fence was, Mr Speaker. That was helpful. At least he knew where the fence was. The current Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Treasurer have been all over the place in their first week and a half in place with respect to economic policy on behalf of the Opposition. Plagiarising the Wall Street Journal, not knowing the Reserve Bank interest rate and, most importantly, knocking over tax relief for middle-income earners in the Senate. In truth, Mr Speaker, the opposition, though, does in reality have a plan, even though they don't quite know they've got a plan. Their plan is simple. The Liberals have a three-point plan for economic policy, oh, no, spreading fear, spending money and wrecking the surplus. That is the three-point plan for economic management that the Liberal Party is putting forward, Mr Speaker. The government has a very different plan. The government has a plan that is built around investing for the future, that is built around investing in infrastructure and skills that will deliver the economic capacity, that will deliver the prosperity into the future and that will deliver sustainable long-term growth for Australia's economy and ensure that the working people and pensioners of this country in the future have decent living standards. The government is going to stick to that plan, Mr Speaker. The government remains committed to delivering that plan, notwithstanding the obstruction and resistance in the Senate. We will continue to pursue all of the elements of our budget in order to deliver that surplus that will be the foundation stone for long-term sustainable growth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Dixon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Treasurer, given that the Treasury estimates that 485,000 adults will drop out of private health insurance as a result of the government's original Medicare levy changes, how many adults will drop out of private health insurance as a result of the government's new proposed changes? And Treasurer, if the changes to the Medicare levy are about tax cuts for families, why is the government making over $300 million out of this measure? The Treasurer. I, uh, I thank the uh the member for his question. I don't accept necessarily the premise of the opposition's critique of the proposal that we are we are putting. Order, uh, order, but Mr. Speaker, order. Mr. Speaker, the, the, uh, the, the, treas the treasury figures are indeed are indeed out there, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and order, they are. and and less. The member for Dixon has asked his question. And Treasurer has the of course call. I accept the Treasury figures, and less, 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 pe less people will, will, will be dropping out. But I don't accept the opposition's critique of the consequences of that, Mr Speaker. I don't accept it for one minute, because your critique says that that, therefore, has an extraordinary impact elsewhere in the health system. And you come in here and carry on about the public hospital system when this government has put an additional $1 billion into the public hospital system, Mr Speaker. $1 billion. And they have the hide, they have the hide in the Senate 
to vote down a tax cut, a tax cut, a tax cut for hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of working families. You should be absolutely embarrassed by your performance in the Senate, Mr. Speaker. And we will run, we will run the bill back up into the Senate, and we will appeal for the support of the minor parties and the support of the Greens, and we will get the support of the Australian people because they deserve some tax relief, which is being denied them, the member for which Dixon. is being denied them, which is being denied them by the Liberal and National parties. And why does it cost? Why is there an advantage in the first year? Because the indexation arrangements are entirely different. The, index, uh, the indexation arrangements are different. That is why. So in the first year, in the first year, it does cost more. In the first year, it costs more, but at the end, there is a greater saving. That is the case. If you are incapable of understanding that and incapable of understanding the Treasury modelling, you are not fit to be the health spokesman. The member for Lin Order. The member for Lindsay has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Will the minister update the House on the latest developments at Eastern Creek Quarantine Station? The Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Thanks very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Lindsay for his question. I'm sure all members of the House are very mindful of the devastation caused 12 months ago uh, by the outbreak of EI. There's been different estimates of the total cost to industry. The figure of $1 billion is often quoted. Uh, it's probably fair to say we'll never know the full extent of the cost of that outbreak. Therefore, we can understand the anxiety felt by many of those involved with the horse industry with the reports uh, overnight, and which more information has come out during the day today, that of the 74 horses in quarantine at Eastern Creek Quarantine Station, one of them did test positive for equine influenza. An immediate retest uh, on the same sample was done last night and on the retest it came back negative. Each horse is tested some five times, uh, twice on pre-export, three times uh, on arrival in Australia. This particular horse had already passed the first four tests uh, with negative findings. The fifth one came through with a positive finding and then there was an immediate retest which again came out negative. To, as an extra precaution uh, to uh, make sure that uh, there is not equine influenza within the quarantine station. Each of the 74 horses within the station has now had two samples taken and they're being sent to two separate labs, uh, the Camden lab and the Geelong lab. Uh, those tests will be done independently and in the next few days we'll be able to know whether or not the negative tests which we have had in every other instance are indeed confirmed by that independent sampling. Mr Speaker, under the new quarantine arrangements for imported horses, each horse has these extra tests taken, two pre-export, three post-arrival. The Eastern Creek Quarantine Station was already in lockdown and remains so. No horses will be released until the test results confirm that they are indeed free from equine influenza. Mr Speaker, quarantine measures at Eastern Creek have been strengthened since last year's outbreak, including 24-hour security close monitoring and strict enforcement of quarantine procedures. Revised import conditions also now enforce a strict vaccination requirement for horses entering pre-export quarantine facilities. On 12 June this year, I released the government's response to the inquiry into the outbreak by Commissioner Ian Callan and AC. The government accepted every single one of the 38 recommendations to strengthen our quarantine measures for imported horses. These recommendations are being implemented with the cooperation of the horse industry, importers, airports, airlines and freight handlers. Uh, this week I met with internationally recognised quarantine expert uh, Dr Kevin Dunn, who has been appointed by the government as Interim Inspector General of Horse Importation, and uh, a bit over uh, about two hours ago uh, I spoke with him on the phone and he was on site out at Eastern Creek. The government takes Australia's quarantine and biosecurity challenges seriously. We need to do all we can to ensure all Australians and other nations have confidence in the integrity of our systems and that we act quickly and efficiently when facing challenges like those at Eastern Creek. As we head towards this year's spring racing carnivals, I acknowledge that the tougher quarantine measures 
do create some inconvenience for industry, but they also place Australia and the horse industry in a much stronger position to withstand threats to our biosecurity. The leader of the Nats, National Thank Party. You. Sorry. <laughs> so, sorry. Well, sorry, the leader of the National Party. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and my question is to the Treasurer. Why should a businessman in Sydney pay less tax on an X-type Jaguar Sports than a fencer in Broken Hill driving a Toyota Land Cruiser across distant paddocks and on dirt roads? The Treasurer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm delighted uh, that the member has asked me that question. He asked me a similar question yesterday, and it. Re and it uh, relates to the luxury car tax, uh, which those opposite tried to defeat in the Senate, tried to oh, vandalise the, uh, uh, the budget surplus for in the Senate uh, only a few days ago, Mr Speaker. And of course, we got a lot of sense, we got a lot of common sense out of the minor parties in the Senate, and they voted for a revised proposal, uh, Mr Speaker. They voted for a revised proposal. Order, the member for and Canning. what occurred in the House? Later on oh, yesterday, be, be uh, Mr. Speaker, was I think it was suggested by the uh, one of the members uh, for the National Party up there that when I had said that the Liberal National Party had introduced this luxury car tax, he got up and said they hadn't. Well, in fact, they did. The member for Higgins introduced the luxury car tax, the new luxury car tax, in 2001. Yes, he did. He did in this house, Mr. Speaker. He introduced the new luxury car tax in this House in 2001. So we Order. put a proposal to increase the luxury car Order. tax from 25 to 33 per cent in the budget so that there would be a small saving from people who bought luxury cars to assist us in the savings process of building a very significant budget surplus. A very significant budget surplus. That's what we did. Now, as a consequence of the vandalism of those opposite in the Senate, and their, their inability to be reasonable in the passage of those budget measures, we agreed to some changes with the minor parties in the Senate. Now, the member opposite pretends to represent rural people when he knows that most four-wheel drives are completely unaffected, completely unaffected by this increase in the tax, and things like farm units are not, farm utes are not affected at all, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. But some fuel-efficient vehicles, which are luxury cars, were exempted as a result as a result of amendments carried in the Senate. The consequence of those amendments is, as the member has indicated, but Mr Speaker, the fact that those amendments occurred is the fault of the Liberal and National parties in this House, because they have put the interests of Porsche drivers ahead of the interests of average working families and people living in regional areas, Mr Speaker. It's as simple as that. The member for Melbourne Ports. Order. The member for Melbourne Ports has the call. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Uh, what is the government doing to remove same-sex discrimination from Commonwealth laws, and what contributions have been made to this debate? The Attorney General. Order. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, thank you uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the honourable member for Melbourne Ports for his uh, question. Uh, yesterday, Mr Speaker, this House passed the second stage of the Rudd government's reforms to remove same-sex discrimination from Commonwealth laws. Uh, in fact, the laws uh, that were passed by this House yesterday removed discrimination from some 68 laws with knock-on effects to others, and they include in the areas of social security, taxation, Medicare and educational assistance. The, de the debate took place uh, over some three days, and there were some outstanding contributions from members for, from both sides, and I congratulate uh, those who participated. I expressed disappointment uh, yesterday, however, that one member was absent from the debate, uh, and that was the member for Wentworth. Uh, members will, members will, recall, uh, will recall that before the uh, last election, the member for Wentworth circulated a newsletter. Order. 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 Government policy. 
The uh, Attorney General has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members will recall in the House that before the last election, the member for Wentworth circulated a newsletter uh, to his electorate uh, in which he supported the need for, for reform. And indeed, that newsletter uh, referred to statements such as Turnbull takes on mission for gay and lesbian rights. Uh, further quote, Malcolm Turnbull has embarked on a personal crusade. Order, the to Attorney General will his resume his seat. The Attorney General will resume his seat. The member for McCullough on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I would draw your attention to standing order number 100, uh, subsection C, and I would say that the uh, minister is reflecting uh, on the um, character of the Leader of the Opposition and therefore is in breach of the standing orders. It can only be done by way of substantive order, and I would ask the question be ruled out of order. Order. I will listen very carefully to the uh, minister's question, uh, to, to his answer. The matters that the uh, member has raised are to do with the question, not, not the standing order relevant to the answer. But I will listen carefully to the Attorney General's response. The statement contained in the newsletter uh, was that Malcolm Turnbull has embarked on a personal crusade to convince his cabinet colleagues. And, uh, the article also quoted the uh, honourable member as, uh, uh, I quote, I pledge to continue the fight uh, until justice Order. is done. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I uh, personally accept and, uh, uh, that the um, honourable member is entirely genuine uh, in and sincere in expressing those Order. views. That is, uh, that is accepted. Uh, but, clearly, but clearly, now that he is uh, in the position of opposition leader, uh, he Order. has uh, he has the ability to exert a uh, a little more than a degree of influence on his uh, on his colleagues. Uh, it was disappointing, and it was sincerely disappointing that the honourable member didn't counter some of those more extreme uh, sentiments uh, that were expressed uh, during the course uh, of the debate uh, yesterday. Uh, indeed, uh, I note that a spokesman for uh, the honourable member told the Age newspaper, or at least is reported in the Age newspaper, that in fact the honourable member had spoken on the first reading of the bill, but I think the record will show otherwise. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Mr Speaker, mm -hmm. these reforms are long overdue. They do nothing more and nothing less than remove discrimination against a group of fellow Australians who have been discriminated against for far too long. They do not uh, undermine in any way, shape or form Order. the institution of marriage. Uh, those, uh, those, um, that is made quite clear in legislation that has been supported in this House that marriage is between a man and a woman. As I say, these uh, reforms do nothing uh, more than, believe, than remove uh, unjustified uh, discrimination that has occurred too long. As I say, I genuinely be believe that the uh, uh, Leader of the Opposition is sincere uh, in his views on this matter, uh, and we look forward to him using his new position to secure passage of the legislation. The member for Cook. Order. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Treasurer. Can the Treasurer please advise the House how many local councils across Australia are exposed to financing arrangements linked to overseas subprime mortgage securities or distressed lending institutions. Treasurer, what will be the impact of this exposure on local government rates, charges, services and infrastructure projects? The Treasurer. Treasurer. Uh, I thank the, uh, the member for his question because the government is aware uh, that some local government councils around Australia are exposed Order. are exposed uh, because they have had investments in organizations such as Lehman Brothers uh, some may have uh, had investments in other subprime type products now most of the high exposure councils appear to be in New South Wales and Western Australia and all other states have relatively little exposure. Uh, to these types of investment. Now, of course, as we all know, Mr. Speaker, local government is established by state and territory legislation, and it is the responsibility of the states and territories to exercise proper financial oversight of council investments. 
Uh, Mr Speaker. I note that the New South Wales and West Australian governments have commenced reviews of the local government investments in 2008 and have certainly significantly <laughs> tightened up on the oversight of local government. I'm also aware that some councils in New South Wales are contemplating legal action to recover some of the investments. Mr. Speaker. So that is the extent uh, of our knowledge of the exposure of local government uh, to these investments. Mr. Speaker. But as we have been saying in this House for a long time and has become readily apparent in recent order. times. The Treasurer will resume his seat. The member for Cook on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker, on relevance. I was specific in my question order. how many local the councils and do Cook you will know? Resume his seat. The member for Cook will resume his seat. The Treasurer is responding to the question. The Treasurer. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know he's a new Shadow Minister, but the truth is they're not accountable to us. But uh, we certainly Order. do take a deep a, a, we do take a deep the interest in these issues, Cooks. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Order. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if they want Order. to play this silly game, when were these investments made, and were they accountable to the previous government? If you want, if you want to, if you want to play that serious game, when were the investments made? Many Australians who are very genuine, many organisations, both government and, and corporate, have made investments in these products. Made, made investments in these products, and they are going to live to regret the investments in these products. And people around this country and around the Order. world have been victims of what is the fallout from the U.S. subprime crisis. And we have said repeatedly, what we need to do is to strengthen our system as much as we possibly can. And as I've said to the House on a number of occasions, we are implementing in full all of the recommendations of the Financial Stability Review, all of those recommendations. And we've been doing that this year. We have introduced legislation in this House to pursue those recommendations to strengthen our financial system. We'll continue to do that. The member for Kingston. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Sport and Youth. Would the minister update the House on the establishment of the new Australian government office for youth? The Minister for Sport and Youth. Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Kingston for her question and note that she is herself a very passionate advocate for the interests of young people in Adelaide's South, as well as I believe being the youngest member of this House herself. So it is my great pleasure to provide both her and the House with further information about the Australian Government Office for Youth, which was launched earlier today. Our government recognises that young people today face some complex and unique challenges, quite unlike those experienced by previous generations. Media reports just this very week highlight issues such as the prevalence of self-harm practices, predominantly amongst teenage girls the intense and increasing focus on body image, or emerging challenges such as cyberbullying which accompany new technologies. In addition to so-called youth issues, we also recognise that there is a generational divide in the opportunities and experiences of younger Australians across a broad range of portfolio areas. Many young Australians have quite different challenges and experiences in areas such as the costs that they pay for their education, the struggles for first home ownership, or the consequences for them of dangerous climate change when the rest of us may not be here to pay the full price. Clearly, different times, different issues require different mechanisms and measures. And through the establishment of the Office for Youth, the Rudd government will be well placed to honour our election commitment and respond to the particular issues, challenges and needs of our youth. The office will undertake a number of key roles. They will play a strategic role across government to bring a youth-specific focus and ensure that the very best policies, programs and services are in place to serve the needs of young people. They will provide a safety net to alert government to issues and initiatives going forward, which may have particular implications for young people, and they will work on a few targeted priority areas. I can announce that one of the first of these will be working with the Ministers for Health, Communications and Status of Women to address what has been identified in major national surveys as one of the very number one concerns of Australian youth, that being healthy body image. The Office for Youth will ensure that at a structural and policy level there is a dedicated focus on young Australians. Our efforts to serve this generation well will be further boosted next week with the official launch of the Australian Youth Forum 
an initiative to better directly engage with both young Australians and the youth sector. This government is strongly committed to making a real difference in the lives of Australia's youth. The announcement today for the Office for Youth is yet another one of our election commitments that have been honoured. It is yet another step forward towards undoing the damage that was done by the previous government in this area. And most importantly, it is another way that the Rudd government are demonstrating our commitment to ensuring that young Australians are empowered, are included and are well supported by their government. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My Order. question is to the Treasurer. Order. Order the Minister for Trade. Deputy Leader of the Opposition has the call. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to his answer yesterday to my question on lack of competition in the mortgage-backed securities market. Will the Treasurer advise the House how issuing further government bonds will increase liquidity in the residential mortgage-backed securities market? The Treasurer. Uh, I, uh, I thank the Order. I thank the Shadow Treasurer for her question because I'm happy to answer questions on liquidity in our banking system. It's a very important issue and perhaps it's never been more important uh, than it is at the moment. And I would like to remind anyone who's uh, commenting uh, on liquidity issues that we are in a very difficult period uh, in, in which matters of confidence are paramount and we do need to keep our comments uh, balanced. I'd like to just quote from the Reserve Bank Stability Review, which was uh, published today, which I think gives a pretty good and comprehensive analysis of what is going on uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the banking sector, uh, what's the, uh, what is going on with uh, deposit-taking institutions, what's going on in terms of securitisation, and so on. And I would commend her to have a look at that. But I just want to quote uh, a little from the report. The Australian financial system is well placed to weather the current difficulties in the global financial system. Australian, the Australian banking sector continues to be highly profitable. The system is soundly capitalised. The banks have high credit ratings and relatively little exposure to US subprime debt. That's very important because when we're talking this issue, we've got to, we have to continue to repeat that so, so this country doesn't get mixed up with the problems that are occurring in the United States. So any loose talk along those lines can be very hurtful to confidence and certainly not uh, very helpful in the current environment. Now, that um, report card, if you like, from the Reserve Bank today Number is not an argument for complacency. Uh, it's an argument for confidence in our system. And if you go through the Reserve Bank report today, you'll see that they do make the comment uh, that securitisation, that in the securitisation market Number at the moment, things are very difficult. Uh, and that those organisations, including smaller banks, uh, and other institutions that have been relying upon securitisation are having great difficulty. And as a consequence, the deposit-taking institutions are doing more business. Certainly those who are in the big four are doing more business. And that tends to indicate to me uh, that we may have uh, some issues in terms of the competitiveness of our mortgage market uh, and that they may need to be addressed uh, in the near future, Mr Speaker. The government uh, has put uh, legislation through this House uh, in Treasurer June, Jimmy which uh, did Treasurer Jimmy Treasurer, Treasurer, Treasurer Jimmy Seat. The member for Menzies on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, on relevance, the question was: Could the Treasurer advise the House how issuing further government bonds improves liquidity order. in the residential mortgage-backed securities market? The member Would he for Menzies the question, will resume please? his answer. seat. The member for Menzies will resume his seat. The the Treasurer will continue responding to the question. The Treasurer. I, I think the problem uh, lies with the, uh, with the member, Order. Mr Speaker. Order. The Treasurer has the call. Mr Speaker, we, we, um, we in June took steps to support liquidity in the bond market, uh, but we also, in June, uh, did broaden the investment powers of the AOFM. We did this to provide increased flexibility to respond to difficult global circumstances, uh, and these powers are there if they need to be used, and they will be used if it's necessary. The member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for the Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Will the Minister update the House on the Government's commitment to increase energy efficiency 
to help reduce Australia's carbon pollution and deal with dangerous climate change. The Minister for Environment, Heritage and the Arts. Yeah, no, there is. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I Order. thank the Minister for Tourism, the Member for Isaacs, for his question, and the Member opposite for her contribution on addressing global warming, which was put shade cloth over Order. the Great the Barrier Reef. And... Address the question. <laughs> They wouldn't ratify Kyoto, but they had the bits of green out ready the to minister go. Minister will address the question. Mr. Speaker, the government takes seriously the need to have a comprehensive approach Order. to tackle dangerous Order climate change and Sturt. in delivering the carbon pollution reduction scheme. Order. In delivering the carbon pollution reduction scheme, we've committed to provide assistance for Australian households to take practical action to reduce their energy use, to save on energy bills and to make a tangible contribution to reducing carbon pollution. And we're bringing forward a national strategy on energy efficiency to provide the coherence and national leadership in this area that's been lacking for the last 12 years. Leadership for business, leadership for industry and for households to take cost-effective energy efficiency actions. And I note today, Mr Speaker, a new report from the Brotherhood of St Lawrence. KPMG and ECOS Corporation, emphasising the importance of energy efficiency for households, particularly those on low income. We welcome the contribution of that report. It's something that the government understands very well. In fact, we're putting in place some $1 billion of household and community renewable energy and energy and water efficiency measures, which we've announced in the recent budget. In fact, since July the 1st, Mr. Speaker, over 2,200 schools around Australia have registered to become solar schools. And we very much welcome that great interest that communities and schools are showing around Australia the for the for Rudd Labor Flinders. government's program. And Mr Speaker, we will be providing more funding and more installations of PV solar systems in 2008-9 than in any year in Australia's history. And of course this comes after the member for Flinders, who's making interjections across the chamber, jumped out of an aeroplane to tell us how the solar industry was in freefall. And, and within days, we, we found that the figures on solar applications for the PVs were at record highs. Memo to the member for Flinders, look before you leap. Mr Speaker, if we look at the coalition policy approach in this area, we can see that there's scant evidence that they recognise the importance of the scale of the challenge or the role that constructive programs and a comprehensive strategy can bring into place. And next month, I'm pleased to say that we'll start seeing the first energy rating labels appear on televisions, which are one of the fastest growing sources of household energy uses. Mr. Speaker, households will soon be able to identify cost-saving, super-efficient appliances through new 10-star labels. And last Sunday, in Melbourne, with the Minister for Finance, I was pleased to announce the Green Precincts Fund, a commitment of some $15 million to support Cal at least Gurley. 10 high-profile energy and water-saving projects around Australia. Mr Speaker, we've launched oh, Green Precincts. Yes. Sorry, the, uh, water minister, savings, that's the Minister right, for Environment will resume his seat. Minister for Environment will resume his seat. The <laughs> member for McEwen on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my point of order is that this minister has no credibility as the Minister for the, the Environment. Mena member for McEwen will excuse herself from the chamber for one hour under 94A. Order. The Minister for Resources and Energy and the Minister for Trade are not assisting. The Minister now has the call. Minister. Thank you. Mr Speaker, despite uh, you know, uh, a team that some of us here support not going quite as close to the grand finals as possible, we were very pleased to launch Greek precincts in a project at Windy Hill in Melbourne, home of the Essendon Football Club. It's also a community facility, Mr Speaker, where families and communities come and kick a footy around with their kids, and they will be installing an innovative 800,000 litre water storage system under the Oval and also renewable energy technologies. Good on your bombers. 
Mr. Speaker, a fantastic program delivering on one of this government's election commitments. These are responsible and positive measures that we're taking now, like the response from the community, like the 2,200 schools already registered to become solar schools. This government is delivering on energy efficiency and tackling dangerous climate change. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is addressed to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to his speech on the 18th of March 2008 and a second speech overseas on the 6th of June where he stated, and I quote, the market for Australian residential mortgage-backed securities vanished late last year. The fact is restated again in the House today. Why has the Treasurer done nothing to support the mortgage lending market in Australia? The Treasurer. Well, I thank the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition uh, for his question. Uh, it is true that uh, late last year and early this year uh, it was very difficult in the securitisation market. It is also true that, as recently as only a month ago, uh, that a number of those institutions that were active there were beginning, were beginning to be successful again. And of course, that has now been, now been dramatically affected by events of the last couple of weeks. That is the very simple uh, answer to the member's question. So, Mr. Speaker, what we are doing is that we are in constant contact contact with our regulators. We want to ensure that the system is robust, it is well capitalised through this difficult period. And the one thing we won't be doing is making silly suggestions like the silly suggestion made by the Leader of the Opposition. The silly suggestion that the Leader of the Opposition made that we should somehow go out and buy US style bad debt. That's what he said on Laurie Oaks last weekend, Mr Speaker. Now I note there's been a fair bit of commentary about the Leader of the Opposition's uh, statements on Laurie Oaks last weekend, not the least of which was from the member for Higgins uh, on, late line, uh, on Late Line on Tuesday night. The member for Higgins uh, was not impressed at all on Late Line on Tuesday night, Mr Speaker. But if I could just, uh, just uh, have a look at what he, what he had to say. This is Peter Costello, Tuesday night. I'm going on to make the point. In my view, no major financial institution in Australia has the exposure to the subprime of anything like the dimension of the United States. Tony Jones, why doesn't Malcolm Turnbull repeat what you say? Peter Costello, you can ask Malcolm Turnbull what he's on about. <laughs> I'll tell you what the situation is. Tony Jones, Tony Jones, Tony Jones. But is it economically wise to be recommending the government back financial institutions if they don't need backing? Peter Costello, if an institution gets into trouble in Australia, there has been backing. HIH is an obvious example. <laughs> That's got to be the understatement of the week, Mr Speaker. The understatement of the week, Mr Speaker. So, so Mr Speaker, the government is watching and monitoring this situation closely. Order the member for North, the there we go. For North Sydney. Okay. Mr. Speaker, Order. Mr. Speaker, the government is in daily contact. The government Order. is in daily, con daily contact with all of our regulators, Mr. Member Speaker, for Higgins. and we stand ready. We stand ready to take any action that is required. But our system Order. is healthy, and you can see it in the, today from the report from the Order. Reserve the Bank. Mr. Speaker. Leader, leader of the opposition, I move that so much of standing orders be suspended as would enable the leader of the opposition to move the following motion forthwith that the Rudd government be condemned for being out of touch, out of its depth and out of the country. In particular, that the government be condemned for its complete indifference to the plight of Australian pensioners who are struggling on a daily basis to meet the rising costs of petrol, groceries and rent, for their complete indifference to the plight of Australian families who are facing increasing job uncertainty and rising day-to-day -day living costs when they were led to believe that Kevin 07 would do something about it. Nice that the move. Prime Minister be condemned for becoming Kevin 747 and spending more time and effort on his grandiose plans for the world than on real plans for Australia. And finally, this House condemns the Treasurer for his complete lack of understanding about the domestic impact of the global financial crisis and his inability to understand the impact it will have on Australian families, their jobs and their mortgages. Mr Speaker, we have seen a Treasurer order, today— the Leader of the Opposition, the Leader of the House on the point of order. Leader of the House. 
I move that the member be no longer heard. Order. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells. Order. The House will settle down. The House will settle down. The Mem Manager of Opposition Business on a point of order. In accordance with Standing Order 67, I ask you to state the question again before it is finally put. Well, the question at the moment before me is that the member be no longer heard. Didn't you pick that up, Joe? Lock the doors. The question is that the member be no longer heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Shortland and Werriwa tell us for the ayes, and the members for Riverina and Ryan tell us for the noes.
for trade. Order. Not assisting the chair. Order. The result of the division is ayes 76, noes 57. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Is the motion seconded? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. This government is afraid of a debate Order. on the, the Leader of the House, of the, the Deputy Leader will resume his seat. The Leader of the House has the call. I move that the member be no longer heard. Order. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. I appoint the same tellers as the previous division. Members must remain in their seats unless they are leaving the chamber, or they did not vote in the previous division, or they are changing their vote, in which case they should report to the tellers. Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the member be no longer heard. Members should have remained in their seats unless they were changing their vote or they did not vote in the previous division, in which case they must report to the tellers. Order. The result of the division is ayes 76, noes 57. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition for the suspension of standing orders and sessional orders be agreed to. The Member for North Sydney. Mr. Speaker, this government doesn't want to have a debate on an the issue that for North goes Sydney to the heart of the Leader of the House. The member for I North Sydney will resume his seat. The Leader of the House. I move that the member be no longer heard. Order. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion say aye. 
contrary, no. I think the eyes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. I appoint the same tellers as the previous division. Members must remain in their seat unless they are leaving the chamber or they did not vote in the previous division or they are changing their vote, in which case they must report to the tellers. Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the member be no longer heard. Members should have remained in their seats unless they changed their vote or they did not vote in the previous division, in which case they should have reported to the tellers by now. Order. The result of the division is I 76, no 57. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House for the suspension of standing and sessional orders be agreed to. The Leader of the House. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that this is the most pathetic suspension in the history since Federation. On 21 occasions, those opposite have moved to suspend standing orders. Those people who have observed this House over a long period of time will know that if you are going to move to a censure, you have to actually build up some sense of momentum. What you can't do is ask nine questions on nine different subjects and then move a motion that doesn't relate to any of the nine subjects that you have raised during question time. The Leader of the Opposition is getting the same bad tactical advice that oh, helped the to leader destroy of the house will resume the his seat. Leader. The leader of the house, the leader of the house will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business. Speaker, I move that the motion be put. Order. The question is that the motion be now put. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes. I think the noes have it. No, Eyes no, have no, it. No, Order. Settle down. <laughs> Settle down. The question now is, the question now is that the motion moved by the leader of the opposition for the suspension of standing and sessional orders be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Yes. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. I will first take advice on the meaning of state in uh, Standing Order 67.
It's a four-minute division. division. Order. The Manager of Opposition Business has raised with me a point of order under Standing Order 67. On the guides that are given to occupants of the chair, it indicates that the question is normally stated by that the question is that the motion be agreed to. So far in this debate, I have at least on three occasions stated the question in the form that the motion is that the that the question is that the motion moved by the leader of the opposition for the suspension of standing and session laws be agreed to the intent of standing order 67 might be interpreted that the full terms of the motion is what should be stated and i'm guided by the final aspect of Standing Order 67, which indicates this requirement shall not apply when the terms of the question or matter have been circulated among members. As I understand it, the full terms of this resolution have not been circulated, and I feel that I should st state the question in full. The question before the House is that so much of standing orders be suspended as would enable the Leader of the Opposition to move the following motion forthwith. That the Rudd government be condemned for being out of touch, out of its depth and out of the country. In particular, one, that the government be condemned for its complete indifference to the plight of Australian pensioners who are struggling on a daily basis to meet the rising costs of petrol, groceries and rent. Two, for their complete indifference to the plight of Australian families who are facing increasing job uncertainty and rising day-to-day -day living costs when they were led to believe that Kevin O7 would do something about it. Yeah. Three, that the Prime Minister be condemned for becoming Kevin 747 and spending more time and effort on his grandiose plans for the world than on the real plans for Australia. Yeah. Four, and finally, that this House condemns the Treasurer for his complete lack of understanding about the domestic impact of the global financial crisis and his inability to understand the impact it will have on Australian families, their jobs and their mortgages. Lock the doors. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Ryan and Riverina tellers for the ayes and the honourable members for Werriwa and Shortland tellers for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is ayes 55, noes 76. The question is therefore negative. Would members, <laughs> would, would members please? I thank the member for Oxley, the member for Wills. I've cleaned my glasses, to, and the member for Lyons. Would everybody please resume their seats quickly and quietly? You, members are denying the member for Wakefield the call. The Minister for Defence. Thank you. The member for Wakefield has the call. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Small Business, Independent Contractors, and the Service Economy. Will the, will the Minister advise the House on the government's unfair dismissal system for small businesses and any reaction to it? Are there any obstacles to the system's implementation? The Minister for Small Business, Independent Contractors and the Service Economy. Well, I thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Wakefield for his question. The Rudd government believes that good workers should not be dismissed on the spot for no reason and with no remedy. At the same time, the government recognises the special circumstances of small businesses. They have no human resource management departments. No, they sorry. can't easily redeploy their staff to other divisions or to other workplaces. And they don't have the time to, for drawn out processes and can't pay expensive legal bills. So compared with larger businesses, small businesses will benefit under our unfair dismissal system from a doubling of the qualifying period from six months to 12 months, during which time no claim for an unfair dismissal can be made. Small businesses will also benefit from a simple six-paragraph fair dismissal code, which, if followed by a small business owner, enables the employer to dismiss an employee fairly. And I want to thank the members of the Small Business Working Group and also the Union Working Group, who worked so hard and so cooperatively with the government in developing this simple but fair system. In working together, we've shown you don't have to make a choice between fairness and efficiency. I'm asked by the member for Wakefield as to the reaction that we have received to the announcement by the Deputy Prime Minister of the government's arrangements for uh, unfair dismissals for small businesses. And I'm very pleased to be able to report that the National Farmers Federation has indicated its support for the regime, and it is said Farmers sign off on government's fair dismissal code. The National Farmers Federation today endorsed the Australian government's fair dismissal code as striking a sensible, practical balance for employers and employees. Now, well, there's also been reaction from the Council of Small Business of Australia, COSBOA, headed fair dismissal code acceptance, and it says small business can be pleased with the outcome as this tool provides a simple checklist to follow which ensures employers can be protected from fraudulent unfair dismissal claims. And the Australian Industry Group has said that the fair dismissal code for small business will be short and easily applied. So there you go, Mr Speaker, uh, endorsements from small business representative organisations. But I was asked about obstacles to the passage of this legislation. Well, Senior coalition frontbenchers have indicated their opposition to providing protection against unfair dismissal for the employees of small businesses. Just a little earlier this month, the deputy leader of the opposition and now the shadow treasurer confirmed that the opposition would adhere to three core principles, including a small, dismissal, a small business unfair dismissal exemption. So there's the deputy leader of the opposition saying that the coalition will support an ongoing exemption, that is, oppose 
our fair dismissal arrangements. And also the sm uh, shadow small business minister who said earlier in the year any attempt by Labor to apply unfair dismissal laws to small business will receive his absolute and confirmed opposition. So what happened a couple of weeks ago to the deputy leader of the opposition and the shadow small business minister under the new leadership of the Liberal Party and the opposition? They were both promoted. They were both promoted because the Leader of the Opposition is opposed to providing basic protections for the employees of small businesses. The Leader of the Opposition is saying that four million Australians, four million Australians who work in businesses, in small businesses, should be able to be sacked on the spot with no explanation and no remedy. And the truth is, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, under the new leadership of the Opposition, under the new Leader of the Opposition, the Liberal Party is still the party of work choices. No matter if there is a change in the leadership, the Leader of the Opposition is, the, is leading the party of work choices. I would urge the Leader of the Opposition here and now to repudiate his Deputy Leader, to repudiate his shadow small business spokesman and pledge his support for the government's fair dismissal system, but he won't because the Liberal Party was, is and always will be the party of work choices, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and there's a pretty clear pattern here. There's a pretty clear pattern here, and that is, Mr. De Mr. Speaker, the pattern Order. is that the leader of the opposition does not support the vulnerable in the country, but supports the powerful in this country. And we've seen that in the budget measures and the behaviour of the leader of the opposition and his party Order, the in the Senate. Town. What's happened? Well, of course, the Medicare surcharge, which would have provided <coughs> Increasing that threshold would have provided much needed relief for people earning between $50,000 and $100,000 opposed, opposing that tax cut for these people in the Senate. Mr Speaker, what are they doing in relation to the Commonwealth Dental Scheme? They are opposing our passage, our ability to restore the Commonwealth Dental Scheme, Mr Speaker. Order the minister resume his seat. The member for Moncrief on a point of order. Mr Speaker, how is this possibly relevant to the question? The, uh, the question was uh, rather broad, but the member will address the question and bring his que uh, answer to the close. Indeed. I will indeed, Mr Speaker. So while they are opposing these measures for vulnerable people, they are also opposing a condensate tax increase that would have allowed the wealthy, the, some of the wealthiest companies in this country, if they got their way, would have ensured that those companies Order. would keep the more of their member earnings. Will bring his, the minister the will bring his tax. answer to a close. Mr. Speaker, the member will bring his answer to a close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. The minister will resume his seat. The member for Moncrief on a point of order. Mr Speaker, again on relevance, the coalition will oppose Labor's order. $20 million tax grab The member for Moncrief knows that that's not step. a point of order. Minister. Mr Speaker, I saw on television today the actor Michael Douglas doing some very important work. Some very important order. work. The, mem some very the mem important minister work will the bring minister. his— The minister will bring his reminded me the minister will bring his leader response of the opposition. To a close. The leader of the opposition is the Gordon Gekko of Australian order. The politics. The member will resume the his Gordon seat. The minister will resume his seat. The minister will resume his seat. The, the minister has resumed his seat. The member for O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I address my um, question to the acting prime minister, and I refer the acting prime minister to reported plans of the Japanese Inpex Group to pipe gas to Darwin for liquefaction. Acting prime minister, what is the estimated increase in global greenhouse gas emissions arising from the manufacture of this unnecessary? extra 800 kilometre pipeline and the ongoing pumping energy requirements. Furthermore, what is the negative effect on Australia's terms of trade and Commonwealth resource rent tax revenue arising from those additional costs? The Acting Prime Minister. 
effect on the terms of trade? Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I think uh, we've uh, seen a very uh, real indication that the opposition is out of questions. And uh, I think it was very generous for the mem member for Kennedy must have consulted with the member for O'Connor in the drafting of Order. that. Uh, in response to the uh, member for O'Connor's question, can I say the following? Uh, number one, it's interesting to me that he should be Order. questioning about greenhouse gases when he sits in a party of climate change sceptics. Order. The acting Prime Minister resume his seat. The member for Connor on a point of order. Uh, on, on the relevance, this is a simple question seeking facts. Why do we have order. to have blustering when member she doesn't know the answer? Member O'Connor resume his seat. The member for O'Connor will resume his seat. The microphone is off, Member for O'Connor. The acting Prime Minister has the call. You make the joke. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, number, number two, can I say to the Member for O'Connor, of course the government's very happy to look into the questions he's raised, should he seriously want to pursue them, and provide him with a briefing on the matter. But it does, it does seem to me that the member for O'Connor might want to think seriously about the policy settings of the political party of which he's a member when it comes to climate change before Order. coming into this House Order. and feigning any degree of concern Order. about the matter. The member for Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the acting Prime Minister. Order. The member for Cunningham will resume her seat. The member for Kalgoorlie will withdraw that remark. Mr Speaker, this government has been asked a serious question about why they are dudding Western Australia for $25 billion. They are frauds. The member for Kalgoorlie will leave the chamber for one hour under Standing Order 94A. I name the member for Kalgoorlie. The Leader of the House. I move that the member be suspended from the services of the House. Order. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion. Order. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Ora. Lock the doors. Question is, the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nays to the left. Point the honourable members for Shortland and Werriwa tell us for the ayes, and the members for Riverina and Ryan tell us for the noes. Well, the result of the, the division is I 76, noes 55. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The member for Kalgoorlie is suspended from the services of the House for 24 hours. The member for Cunningham. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting Prime Minister. Would the minister please update the House on progress made by the government in replacing work choices and analysing its effects on working families? How important is it to provide certainty and stability in the workplace relations system and to provide for job security? The acting Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Cunningham for her question as we draw to the end of another sitting fortnight in the federal parliament. An interesting sitting fortnight it's been, starting, of course, with the memoirs for the member for Higgins, uh, inclusive of a change of leadership with a new leader of the opposition. Tried. Of course, encompassing a gas-filled start by the new shadow treasurer, and now, most <coughs> remarkably today, giving us the spectre of an opposition gagging its own 
suspension motion oh. and the appointment of the member for O'Connor in charge of Liberal Party tactics in this place. A remarkable week, a remarkable week, Mr. Still Speaker, in Australian politics. I'm asked at the Order. end of this uh, remarkable Order. fortnight in Australian politics, where we've seen these events emerge. About, uh, about progress in the government's agenda in workplace Order relations and getting Cook. rid of work choices. And can I remind the House that, of course, the government has already delivered the end of Australian workplace agreements through its Transition Act, and we will, before the end of the year, introduce into this parliament the rest of the government's forward with fairness agenda to introduce fairness and balance back into Australian workplaces, a safety net that people can rely on, a fair bargaining system, a new industrial umpire and a fair system for unfair dismissals. And of course, we know the history of work choices and Australian workplace agreements is one of rip-offs. It's one where we know from data that 63 per cent of Australian workplace agreements cut penalty rates, 52 per cent cut shift loadings and 51 per cent cut overtime. But I'm asked by the member for Cunningham about progress on analysing the impact of work choices on working families. And at the end of this sitting fortnight, I regret to inform the House that a new analysis is not available. I had hoped, Mr Speaker, that with the publication of the member for Higgins' memoirs that we would have the inside story of work choices. We would have access, finally, no, no, to the inside Howard government information about how much they knew about how bad work choices was. Mr Speaker, I even went to the trouble of getting a discounted copy of the member for Higgins' book out of the remainder bin at a bookshop. It, it cost, cost me slightly over $30, Dick's discounted from $55. Uh, the bookshop proprietor said to me, if you picked out one that was signed, he'd give you 10 bucks to actually take it out of the shop. But the one I, the one I picked out of the bin wasn't signed, so I actually had to part with $30 for it, but not $55. But having parted with the money, Order. having parted with the money Order. to help the member for Order. Higgins' book sales, to help him with his royalties, you know, I'm a Order. generous woman, Mr. Speaker, a generous woman. I, I looked. Uh, uh, I looked uh, well. You know, he's offering to sign it, and then I can give it to someone and give him ten bucks to take it as well. Um, <laughs> But, Mr Speaker, uh, despite my act of generosity Order. in supporting the member for Higgins' income stream, I had a good look at it and the words work choices aren't mentioned once. Not once. Writing the history of the Howard government and you don't mention work choices. Purporting to write the last term of the Howard government 2004 to 2007, and you don't write work choices in there. The acting prime minister, the acting prime minister, will resume his seat. The member for Sturt on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, on the point of relevance, how is any of this piffle relevant to the question? Oh, the acting the prime minister. Member for Sturt will resume his seat. The acting for the acting prime minister has the call. Order. Acting Prime Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I was asked about updates to analysis on work choices, and I thought the member for Higgins' book might be of use in that regard, but unfortunately it wasn't. Uh, the member for Higgins' book, though, does take the opportunity to chide the uh, leader of the opposition, the member for Wentworth, on tax policy, an interesting addition to the member for Higgins' book. And to uh, quote the Merchant of Venice, I suspect the member for Higgins knows that all that glistens is Order. not gold, Mr Speaker. All that glistens <laughs> is not gold. Order. Uh, and he's worked out that the member for Wentworth's claims to economic responsibility are as fraudulent as fool's gold itself. But can I also say, Mr Speaker, that I do have good news for the House on the question of new analysis of the impact. Order. <laughs> Get back to the ball. Order. <laughs> I'm the only one still. Order. I'm pleased that there's some common hilarity, but I would just assist the chair if the 
The Acting Prime Minister addresses the question and starts on the downward spiral to the end of her answer. The uh, Acting I'm, Prime I'm, Minister. Order. I, I, I and am, the member for Higgins should not encourage it. I, I am doing everything I can to help the member for Higgins with those sales because you know I do think it's demeaning that it's in the remainder bin so quickly after publication. So, so I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to help push Order. the book. Uh, I am in a position to advise the House that a new analysis of work choices will shortly be available. The member for Higgins promised us a sequel, and here it is, the sequel to the Costello memoirs, My Role in Work Choices, Order. and this time the, the co-authors, the HR bring the her Society. answer to a close. The member, the acting Prime Minister. Uh, I move that further questions be placed on the notice paper. There's only so much we can do Order. to help the member for Higgins. Order. Before there are a couple of people that indicated they have business for me, but be, before I do that, can I make a statement that I hope will uh, unite the House? This week, a highly valued and very well respected member of the staff of the Parliamentary Library, Mr. Andrew Chin, retires. Many members and senators have benefited from Mr. Chin's advice on a wide range of issues and will recall how helpful he has been and the breadth of his knowledge. Mr Chin's path to the Parliamentary Library took him across the sea and required a commitment to education in two nations. He came to Australia from Malaysia in January 1972 to undertake a graduate diploma in librarianship at the Canberra College of Advanced Education and stayed in Canberra ever since. While he was finishing his studies, he worked briefly in the National Library until he gained a permanent position in the Parliamentary Library in June 1973. This makes Andrew the longest continuously serving member of the library staff and the longest serving reference librarian. Andrew's first role in the Parliamentary Library was a social policy subject librarian for a year covering issues such as consumer protection and Aboriginal affairs. When he joined the library, there was no email, no fax machine, and members and senators came to the old parliamentary library to ask questions, sometimes on their way to the dining room. Andrew has a fabulous nose for information and would ferry out the most tricky information from a network of contacts extending across the world to meet the tightest deadline. In mid-1974, Andrew became the foreign affairs and defence subject librarian. He has worked in the field of foreign affairs ever since. This grew to include his responsibility for the library's United Nations deposit collection. In 1984, Andrew and two other staff members travelled through the South Pacific for a month to examine how Australia could assist parliaments of the region to develop libraries of their own. Andrew went to Western Samoa, the Cook Islands, Tonga and Nui. The result of this trip was the establishment of measures to assist parliaments in the South Pacific, including a training program for staff providing library services to parliaments in the region. In addition, Andrew provided these parliamentary libraries with a current awareness service for some years. The Australian Parliamentary Library continues to assist libraries of parliaments in the South Pacific to this day. In 1995, Andrew's professionalism, knowledge and skill were recognised by the United States Embassy with an invitation to participate in a month-long visitors program. This includes visits to the Library of Congress, the Brookings Institution and universities which were involved in the early internet and the world's first virtual libraries. In his long and successful career, Andrew has, been, has seen many changes in the way the Parliamentary Library provides services to its clients. But no matter how he delivers his services to the library's clients, Andrew has always been highly professional courteous and charming. His colleagues in the library will miss him enormously and are preparing to extend their expertise to fill in the gap he will create. Many members and senators will also miss his great detective skills and wonderful briefs. On behalf of all members, I wish Andrew best wishes in his future endeavours. The Acting Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. If I could associate the government uh, with your tribute to Mr Andrew Chin, 
I'm sure that every member of this parliament uh, is well aware from personal experience of the great service of the parliamentary library. Uh, we all rely on it. We rely on their professionalism. We rely on their assistance. I'm aware Andrew's been here and been such a pivotal part of the library for a long period of time, and he's seen huge developments in that time, including the move from the old parliament house to here. I suspect the development of all the new technology in that period hasn't actually made the job any easier. If anything, it's possibly made it harder, as our requests for information from the parliamentary library become ones where we set uh, or wish for uh, return of information ever more quickly. Uh, I also suspect that one of the challenges for Andrew in the old Parliament House uh, wasn't so much being asked by members of Parliament on the way to the dining room for information. It may have been being asked by members of Parliament on their way back from the dining room that actually was the more profound challenge. Uh, we, uh, we all wish him well. It's a, a very proud record of service uh, to be working in the Parliament in any capacity over that amount of time. Uh, really does show a very special dedication to the working of the parliament and the working of the Australian democracy, and we wish him very well for his future. Yeah. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, uh, on behalf of the Opposition, I associate ourselves on the Opposition benches with the very generous tribute you've paid to Andrew and indeed the remarks made by the Acting Prime Minister. Uh, none of us would be able to uh, sound as well informed as we hope we do sound without the support of the library. Uh, they have a great challenge uh, assisting all of us, and uh, we could not do our work without them. They are indeed the unsung heroes of this place, and we applaud Andrew for his many years of great service. Uh, the member for Longman. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I seek leave to make a personal explanation. Does the honourable member claim to have been misrepresented? Almost grievously, Mr. Speaker. The member for Longman. Mr. Speaker, the member for North Sydney asked the acting prime minister a question, allegedly quoting from a speech I made in the House. But he selectively quoted me when, when he and when he admitted in the same sentence was, so that the people in their electorates can look them in the eye and say, your actions in blocking government money have led to the loss of infrastructure in our electorates. Mr Speaker, I did not say that this would be a great way to handle the distribution of taxpayers' money, and I also pointed out that this was against government policy. Yeah. Order. order. I present the Auditor General's Performance Audit Report No. 5 of 2008-9, entitled The Senate Order for Departmental and Agency Contracts, Calendar Year 2007 Compliance. The Leader of the House. Uh, I move that the report be made a parliamentary paper. Well, the question is that the report be made a parliamentary paper. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. If I could the seek your indulgence. Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker um, after our consultation with the Manager of Opposition Business, it might suit the House to receive the message from the Senate on condensate now. For the benefit of uh, members, uh, it has to be received because it's a request from the Senate. It has to be received here, then go back to the Senate, then come back here. So the earlier we deal with it, uh, the shorter we will be sitting, which might sit, suit the uh, convenience of the House. <laughs> 